The following program is real and may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Everyone in this program is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Certain details may have been changed to protect witnesses or the investigation. In the big city, murder is a fact of life. Victim, I think, is shot running out of the apartment. Indianapolis is no different. You're not even mad enough to tell me that my little cousin's dead? But in Indy, killers get locked up. You've given me the best lead of my case so far. It has what many cities don't, an all-star homicide shift that works a steady stream of calls from 2 till 10, seven days a week. Bring him in with legal representation. When these killer cops catch a murder case, it gets solved quickly. I can't believe that just happened. Indianapolis, Halloween night. 911. Hi, um, there's these guys. I believe they're fighting. We don't know. We're inside the house, but we heard gunshots. How many shots did you guys hear? Three or four, maybe. 911. Yeah, there's bullet shots, gunshots out here in my apartment. How many shots did you hear? Sounded like about 10 or 15 of them. I'm in route to a person shot, possible 10 0 on the scene. Uh, way east side of the city, so. 21, 33, 10, 23. Detective Chris Menina is headed to an apartment complex where a young man has reportedly been shot. She is awaiting word of his fate. If he dies, this Halloween night murder will be her case. Every single year as a child, I dressed up as a cop, so. Um, I guess this year's no different. I've been by subject is 10 0, but it's our crime lab and no father. I'll call it 10, please. He's dead, so I could feel it. About the last three hours, I knew we were probably going to get one, so welcome to Halloween in Indianapolis. Halloween night, she had a feeling. Sometimes you get that feeling. Well, she didn't, but sometimes you do. Detective Tudor is already on site and will assist Menina at the crime scene. It appears to be a, a, a black male, lying face down. It appears to be money, small bag of, looks like suspected marijuana. And that's all we know right now. So we don't know who he is. In the courtyard of an apartment complex, an unidentified young man lies dead. We don't know anything yet until we start sorting things out. and. Uh, try to piece together what, what happened here. <sighs> Shell casings found in a nearby building suggest that is where the shooting began. Okay. Is there, do we have any blood anywhere? There's a hole right here. Right. It looks like powder, maybe, I don't know. There's the shell casing. Detective Menina believes the incident may have started in the stairwell, where an undetermined number of shots were fired. Yeah. I think it's a nine millimeter. It's like nine millimeter. Yeah, okay. Hey guys, can we make sure that nobody touches that shell casing? The shooting appears to have continued outside, where there are more shell casings. Holes. And where stray bullets entered nearby apartments. Right now it's just a cluster because there's several different areas. Uh, it looks like where this altercation took place, so. With such a chaotic crime scene, Menina needs to rely on witnesses to recreate what happened. Hi, Detective Menina from Homicide. I just wanted to look to see where it came through. One bullet went through the wall of an upstairs unit, mere feet from two sisters and a baby, just back from trick-or-treating. Did you hear an argument? A little bit. Not a lot. Like, we couldn't hear what they were saying, because obviously they were all the way down at the bottom, but I heard male voices mm -hmm. a little bit elevated. OK. I just know when we came in, there was a young gentleman um, standing on the stairs by the mailbox. One of the sisters describes a young man she saw sitting where detectives believe the shooting started. Brown standing, her tone, a little bit um, faded off hair, 
real short haircut. Anything that you hear, if you could call me, okay? okay. Make sure we've got crime lab covers this apartment. Outside, another witness says he was caught in the crossfire between two men shooting at each other. Two black males passed me up and then started using me as a shield to fire back. And then I dropped to the ground because I told them to get away from me. And I dropped to the ground. Had you seen it before? I, it said I couldn't even make them out. I know that they okay. were black males. It was dark. And so they were shooting this way. Shooting Could you see back. the victim? Which way he was going? Uh, no, I know that they went running that way. Although there are several eyewitnesses, none can describe the men involved, and the victim is still unidentified. What other witnesses do we have? We've got people that live here. He, he, he knows the victim. He goes to school with them. Okay. He's not sure on a name. Finally, Menina gets a lead. A witness claims to know the victim. Just, you guys knock on the door, see if he's there. If he's there, grab him up. We'll take him downtown. Menina drives back to headquarters to interview the witness. The victim is found on the ground with money right beside him and I think some marijuana, so um, it's not rocket science, it was probably a robbery. Still, you live that type of lifestyle, you still don't deserve to get killed. And he was loved and cared for by somebody and, you know, he didn't look very old, so, you know, not long ago he was, he was probably trick-or-treating and a good kid and then got wrapped up in some stuff that got him killed. Okay, this is a taped statement given by uh, Jacob to Detective Menina with the IMPD homicide. Around 7.30, I'm on my way home. Okay. And um, I get to the door and I see my friend sitting at the stairs and I was like, what's up, what you doing? Who's your friend? The witness gives her a possible first name for the victim, Craig. And he's just sitting on the stairwell by himself. And what do you say to him? I say, what's up, what you doing for drama? He was, like, he was like, I'm just sitting here waiting for somebody. I was like, all right, man, be safe. OK. The witness spoke to his friend, Craig, who was sitting in the stairwell just minutes before the shooting. That's when I see three guys with the red hoodies come down from the stairs. So you saw three black males coming down the steps. Never seen him before. And you heard somebody say, don't get, you ain't getting my stuff. You did hear somebody say, I'm not going to give you. Did no, you? He said, um, he said a curse word. Man. That's OK. He said, you ain't going to get my and that's when I heard. Bah. The witness says Menina's suspicion that it was a robbery may be correct. All right, I'll get you guys a ride home. I appreciate it. Back at the crime scene, Detective Tom Tudor has the coroner take fingerprints of the victim. This looks pretty good. Pretty good? Yeah. All right. We'll be on the way then. Tudor immediately brings them back to Menina at headquarters for an ID. Here's a print. Great, great, great. Trick or treat. OK, do you have a possible name? No, I don't have You don't have anything? The computer finds a match, but it's not who Menina was expecting. Coming up, the victim's identity is revealed. Oh my okay. It's my and the case takes off. <sighs> Detective Chris Menina is investigating the murder of a young man shot outside an apartment building on Halloween night. The victim has remained unidentified until now. Jonathan Brewster. 24-year-old Jonathan Brewster was a lifelong resident of Indianapolis. He is survived by his mother. For Jonathan Brewster, you've given me the best lead of my case so far. <laughs> I got the name of the victim, so that always makes life easier. The victim is not Craig, as Menina previously thought. His confirmed name is Jonathan Brewster. All righty. Start doing some research on who he is, find out who his next of kin is, and go ruin their day. Yeah, he's been arrested. He's been on parole. 23 All right. This is never fun either. 
He had been arrested previously, and on the police report, he gives this address his mom. So I uh, have to go wake up mom and let her know that uh, her son's been shot and killed this evening. Jocelyn, looking for her. No, Jocelyn lives here. OK, do you guys know a uh, Jonathan Brewster? No? Because he was killed tonight, and I'm trying to notify family. Yes, I do. OK. Oh, oh my god. Oh, my god. It's my cousin. OK. It's my cousin. Okay. Oh, my god. Sorry to have to tell you like that, but I didn't think you knew him. Oh, oh my god. It's, uh... does, does, does his mother live here? No. OK. Is, is that her name, Jocelyn? Is that correct? Yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> the victim's cousin immediately calls the mother and hands the phone to Menina. This is his mother. Okay. I can't tell her. Okay. This is Detective Menina from IPD Homicide. Menina has no choice but to do the notification over the phone. Ma'am, I'm sorry, uh, but Jonathan has been shot and killed this evening. Where, where are you located at, ma'am? <laughs> Menina quickly goes to talk to the victim's mother. Oh, Lori. Hi, I'm sorry. You sure that's my boy? Yeah. Are you sure that's my boy? I <laughs> Are y'all sure that's my boy? Yeah, I mean, we took fingerprints of him at the scene, and, and there was fingerprints on file. And I'm sorry, to, to, I, I didn't want to call, tell you on the phone, but she called you real quick. And the, the East New York Street is what we that had is. for you, yeah. Mm. So I was kind of just, you know, she handed me the phone real quick. So mm. right now it looks like he had a little bit of dope on him. He had a little bit of money. And some witnesses think they heard him say, you're, you're not going to get this or something from me. And then they heard shots. So I think I know maybe it was an attempt robbery. Who was Johnny's best friend? Me. You? OK. I'll tell you, I'll do everything I can. Yeah, there's nothing you can do. Well, I mean, you... find the person who pulled the trigger. I mean, well, you got to forgive him, too. Well. But I do. But um, my boy, <laughs> I'll say he did. I have to see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, I'll do everything I can. All right. First thing in the morning, Menina attends the autopsy. She's learned that 11 shell casings were found at the crime scene. If any of those bullets are found in the victim's body, they could be matched back to a killer's gun. Being able to get a bullet out of the body is just evidence, and it's always nice to be able to show the jury, you know, what you recovered. It makes it a little bit more real to them. Uh, the decedent has one uh, gunshot wound uh, entered in the, in the left back, kind of went through the ribs, and went through the uh, posterior part of the heart. The medical examiner has discovered that Brewster was killed by a single bullet through the heart. And there was no projectile covered on the x-ray. OK. OK. Thank you. The bullet went right through Brewster's body, leaving no physical evidence for Menina. I thought there was going to be a bullet inside of him. There wasn't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's not completely disappointing, but I'd rather have a bullet inside of him than not. So. With no real leads, Menina brings in the victim's girlfriend. She needs new information to make her next move. Uh, is it D-E-T-R-A? Yeah. Jonathan's girlfriend? Yeah. Did he wake up with you Saturday morning? That woke him up at 3 o'clock. In the afternoon? OK. And um, I had to go drop my son off to uh, his auntie to go 
to the Halloween party. Mm -hmm. And as I was, we was about to go out the door, that's when uh, his friend came over. Dietra says that on the afternoon of Halloween, Jonathan was hanging out with a friend she knows as Shorty. Was Shorty alone? No. Do you know who he was with? I don't know the dude's name. I just got my second time seeing him. Okay, so just another guy? Yeah. She left Jonathan with his friends and ran some errands. He called her several times using Shorty's cell phone. He just kept calling me. Okay, so as you're dropping your son off and getting shoes, he's calling you a bunch? Yeah. Now, quarter to eight, he called me. And that was the last I talked to him. And he's still with Shorty at that time because he's yeah, on his phone. Called, yeah. He's obviously with Shorty. He's using Shorty's phone 18 minutes before he's shot, so we know that he's with him. Manina has a lead. She needs to track down Shorty, who may have been the last person to see Jonathan alive. Well, obviously, I need to talk to him and want to talk to him to do the right thing, because at the end of the day, all I want to do is get the shooter. All right, this is the end of the statement given by Miss Gray. Hello? Later that day, Manina gets a phone call from the victim's cousin, the one who had lied to her about knowing Jonathan the night before. She now wants to cooperate and says she has information about Shorty and her dead cousin, Jonathan okay, Brewster. Thanks. All right, bye-bye. First night, she was very uncooperative, um, you know, so I don't anticipate um, a lot of information from her, but you never know and we'll see. Menina heads to her house to talk. Okay, I want to take you back to Halloween day. Did you see, um, and you guys call him J Boog, right? J Boogie or something? We call him J Boogie, yes. Okay. okay. The victim, what Jonathan, also went by the nickname J Boogie. When was, when did you first see him that day? Between four and six, I'm not really quite sure. Sure, that's okay. The cousin so says she saw the victim with two friends, one of whom was Shorty. How long have you known Shorty? Mm, since like February, March of this year. Do you recall what they were talking about? Just females and, you know, females they met that day mm -hmm. and what they were going to do later that night. Mm -hmm. You know, just men talk really. It was kind of getting on my nerves. That's why I ended up going upstairs before they even left. Okay. The cousin says she went upstairs and slept. Then, just after the time of the shooting, Shorty returned to her house. Was he upset? He was just calm. He was calm as ever. Jonathan's cousin says Shorty acted like nothing was wrong. I asked him, where is my cousin? Mm -hmm. And he said he didn't know. <laughs> Does he stay very long? No. OK. After Shorty left, the other friend of Jonathan's came back, telling a very different story. And he was like, man, I don't know whether Jay Boog's dead or alive. And I was like, slow down, bro. You feel what I'm saying? Talk about my little cousin. Now slow down, tell me what happened. And he told me, at least I thought he told me. What did he tell you? He told me that they went to go hit this lick. The cousin says the three men were allegedly hitting a lick, slang for pulling off a robbery. But their target retaliated. Do they rob people? The first time I ever known them hitting a lick was that night. OK. He goes over to hit a lick, and then what? They, they hit it. They got away with it, and they were walking down the street, and that's when the dude came out and started shooting, and Johnny got hit. Allegedly, a gunfight broke out. Jonathan was shot, and the others ran away. He heard Johnny say, oh, and then the other two took off running. The cousin says that after telling the story, the friend left. So then y'all pull up mm -hmm. and tell me. It wasn't until Menina told her that Jonathan was dead that she finally knew for sure. Then Shorty returned. After you guys left, he ended up coming back. And I was like, why you lie to me? Why did you lie? I had to hear from somebody, a stranger, and a cop at that, that my little cousin is dead, and you weren't even man enough to tell me? All right, have you seen Shorty since? No. You mm -hmm. haven't seen him since you mm -hmm. went off on him? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't go over there and hit a lick without a gun, would they? No. OK, what have you seen Shorty carry before? Uh, I know he has a nine. OK. With Jonathan's cousin's allegations and Shorty's reportedly strange behavior, Menina now explores a shocking possibility. There's also a chance that Shorty shot your cousin accidentally. <laughs> okay. And you know what? Had you heard that at all? No, ma'am, I haven't, but he was acting kind of weird. 
after all this. Yeah. You know what kind of bullet it was? I know that the shell casings were all nine millimeters. Right now, there's probably two scenarios. Um, one that whoever these guys were robbing uh, shot back and killed Jonathan. And the other scenario is that uh, Jonathan got caught and killed in a crossfire and, uh, you know, Shorty may have shot him accidentally. So Shorty uh, just becomes extremely important because we know he was with the victim and he can answer some of the questions of, of how it went down. Um, so he just becomes extremely important in piecing uh, the investigation together. Coming up, Manina brings in the violent crimes unit to hunt down Shorty, and he proves to be a hard man to find. The following program is real and may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Everyone in this program is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Certain details may have been changed to protect witnesses or the investigation. 24-year-old Jonathan Brewster was murdered, and Detective Chris Manina needs okay. to talk to the victim's friend, Shorty, to find out what happened. We need him down here. You can tell them that, look, he's involved in this homicide. He is there when this thing goes down. She briefs members of the Violent Crimes Unit who need to bring Shorty in for questioning. But there's somebody in that courtyard shooting, and it's not the victim. So just tell him he's smack dab in the middle of it, you know, and we need to talk to him as soon as possible. I mean, just get him here because that's the most important thing. Him. This is his address. He lists on the uh, on his parole. This is Victoria's address. She's a girlfriend. Hey, Victoria. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? I'm Detective Mike Conan. Can, can I come and talk to you real quick? Come in. Okay. I got an answer, I got Shorty is not in the house. Very, very, very important. Okay. <gasps> Where can we find him? But his girlfriend, Victoria, is. She agrees to come downtown and talk to Menina. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, let me tell you, right up front, you're not in any trouble, okay? So take a deep breath. I'll just been trying to stay out of trouble. You're not in any trouble. I just had you brought down here because it's a little bit easier for me to talk to you, okay? You're not in any trouble, I promise. Look at me, okay? You're not in any trouble, okay? But I'm hoping that you can help me a little bit, okay? So, for how long have you guys been together? Just approximately almost two months. Two months? Yeah, two and a half months, about, yeah. Do you remember Halloween night? Yeah. Okay. Victoria confirms that Shorty was with Jonathan Brewster on Halloween and they were in and out all day. They was together, but later when he came back, he wasn't with them. Okay. And when he came back, he was normal, like everything's okay? Yeah, he okay. wasn't nothing out of character. Victoria says Shorty left town late on Halloween night. He left Saturday. When I came back from my girl's night out thing, mm -hmm. He said he was leaving, he was going out of town. Did he give you any indication when he might be home? He didn't give me exact time. Okay. Didn't mention to you about anything that happened over the Halloween weekend? Did he do something really bad? Well, let me ask you this. Have you seen Jay Boog? No, I ain't seen him. Have you heard what happened to him? His cousin across the street said he got shot. Okay. He did get shot and he died, okay? And I'm not trying to upset you. And I don't know. For real? Yeah, and, and, and l listen to me. I want you to listen to me before you start freaking out, okay? Sensing an opportunity, Menina takes a chance and asks for Victoria's help. A move that could bring in her only person of interest or push him even further into hiding. Let me ask you this. You think you can get him home? Think you can get him to come home? Probably so. Okay. I don't know. I probably could. Okay. It's feel bad. Well, I don't wanna, no, 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 no. I'm not going to get you jammed up in this. I know. I don't want to be involved in it, but right. I like him, too. I know. And 
I mean, I'm being straightforward. I do like him, but if he did something he wasn't supposed to, mm -hmm. then he he do need to be brought into custody. I'm not trying to. Well, I understand. Now, that, we're not we're not talking about custody. I'm talking about having a discussion with him, like I'm having one with you. What I need from you is for you to set up something and get him back here. Either it be, I've got some money, or I need you back here, or whatever it is that you need to do. Work your female thing and say that I need you to come back, okay? okay? Just get him here, just get him here for me. Can you help me with this? I can help you with that, okay. I'll try my best. Okay. Hi, Victoria, what's up? Later that night, Victoria calls Manina to report in. Oh, <laughs> Okay. She told Shorty that he has to get back to Indianapolis because she's pregnant. Okay. Um, so keep in touch with me. Call me every day when you talk to him, okay? All righty. Thank you so much, Victoria. All right. Bye-bye. She told him he was, she was pregnant. <laughs> She needed to get down here. Love it. Victoria, you're the bomb. Awesome. Coming up. All I need is the truth. Shorty takes the bait. You're not, you're not under arrest. But can Manina keep him from walking out of the interview room? You really want to do it that way? Yeah, absolutely. For more on The Shift, visit investigationdiscovery.com slash the shift. Jonathan Brewster was killed when a robbery went bad and turned into a gunfight. Brewster's best friend Shorty was with him when he was killed, and Manina needs to find out if Shorty accidentally shot his own friend. I think Shorty is calling me. Hello? Detective Manina, are you in the city? Shorty has been called back to town by his girlfriend, and she convinces him to contact Manina. He agrees to come to headquarters. I need to speak with you for a little bit. Do you want me to come get you? All right, bye-bye. Shorty may be the only person so far that can shed light on how Jonathan Brewster was killed. He got down here pretty quick from the girlfriend calling, so I'm expecting that he'll speak with me um, and give me some information. With Shorty waiting in an interview room, Manina recruits Sergeant Jeff Breedlove to help with questioning. First, we've got to get by the fact that he's going to try to tell me he wasn't there. This is Sergeant Breedlove. You want to get a smart guy? What? You got a smart guy? Yeah, I need a smart guy. I look like a smart guy. Yeah, what do I look dumb? <laughs> uh, You're not under arrest. So I don't have to stay here? No. You came down here voluntarily. I need to talk Shorty to you. Shorty suddenly quiet. changes his mind about talking. Okay, that's what we need. But you're not under arrest, okay? So you're, you I can leave. Days, so. Listen, you can leave whenever you want. All I need is the truth of what happened. I'm not looking to jam you up at all. I was not there when he makes me this. You really want to do it that way? You want me to leave? No. He, well, why is he the smart guy? That part. <laughs> why is it? Wait, 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 wait. Well, let me talk to you by yourself. Let me. We'll leave him out. Let, hey, sit back down here. I'll leave him out in the hallway. Give me five minutes. You can leave in five minutes. Is that fair? You don't want to get this over with today? You want? You don't want to listen to what she's got to tell you? You're not. You're not under arrest. Okay. With no grounds to hold him. Manina can only watch as Shorty walks out the door. He's leaving. I can't keep him. Damn it. My intellectual look just ruined her whole uh, interview. He took one look at me and said, oh, hell no, he's too smart. Unbelievable. That's the first time anybody's ever said that. <laughs> he obviously didn't talk to my uh, high school guidance counselor. I'm sorry. I didn't, Not your fault. I don't fault. know what I... <laughs> I didn't say one word to him. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I know. Like, you think that maybe, like, he saw the room and felt like he was... 
I told him he wasn't under arrest. Like, you're not under arrest. I'm trying to get this worked out. I can't believe that just happened. Good thing I didn't bring these reading glasses in, or he would have really, he would have been running out the door. <laughs> The next day, Menina starts over. She has to drum up a new lead. I'm on my way back out to the scene with my coworkers to do a canvas and see if anyone will stop one of us and give us any more information. Armed with a $1,000 reward for information leading to an arrest, all the middle shift detectives spread out, trying to hit every apartment in the complex. So I think if we do this building and then that one, I mean, I, we could maybe do that one, I guess. Yes, please. How you doing? Detective Menina from Homicide. You have one second? Uh -huh. OK, I'm not investigating that homicide that occurred the other night. Do you mind if I come in here for a second? Please. Hi, how are you? We're just doing a knock and talk in reference to the homicide that happened on Halloween night. I'm going to give you a flyer. Hello. <laughs> wow. Hey, cool. My name is Detective Brasso. I'm a homicide detective with the city. Were you home the night where this guy was killed? No, I was at my house. Anything good? I have a few people that heard the gunshots but didn't see anything. Yeah, the thing is, is that everybody freaking knows and nobody will just, you know. The canvas pays off. Indianapolis Crime Stoppers gets an anonymous tip. To decipher the message, Menina enlists the help of patrol officer Erica Jones, who knows the neighborhood well. I just got a Crime Stopper that says, suspect responsible for the murder is a 16-year-old male. Caller advice the suspect's mother. A Jones recognizes the name as a neighborhood woman who has a son known as Craig. Wow. On the night of the murder, a witness alleges to have seen a young man called Craig just before the shooting. At the time, he feared Craig was the victim. The shooter named in the tip could be the same young man seen that night, likely the target of the alleged robbery. That was the kid sitting on the steps. Now, Menina needs to get a confirmation from her initial witness. She heads back to the apartment complex to find him. What's going on, man? How you been? I want to show you a quick picture. Take two seconds, OK? I just want to show you a photo array real quick. You recognize anybody in that photo array? If he recognizes the person named in the tip as his friend Craig, who he saw the night of the murder, Menina will have a new suspect. Which one was sitting on the, on the stairway when you got home from trick-or-treating? OK. And that was it. So okay. what? Menina gets confirmation, and the investigation is back on track. All right, man, thanks. This is Detective Menina from Homicide. How are you? Because her potential suspect is a minor, and she doesn't yet have enough probable cause for an arrest warrant, Menina calls his mother to see if she'll bring him in. We're trying to make this as, as peaceful for everybody as possible. She agrees to come down to headquarters without her son to talk. And I appreciate that, because that will help a lot. OK, thanks. Bye. Well, the first thing is, does she show up? That's the big hurdle. We shall see. Coming up, Craig's mother shows up. To be perfectly honest, at this point in time, he is a suspect. But refuses to bring in her son. Why are we not getting this resolved right now? Do you know how bad that looks? After hitting a dead end in the murder investigation of Jonathan Brewster, Detective Menina finally gets a break. 
through a Crime Stoppers tip, a teenager named Craig has emerged as the possible suspect. Now, Menina waits to talk to Craig's mother. Homicide. Yep. Send her up. Yep, great, thanks. I want to go in and, and put her on my team. So we are a team trying to figure out what the truth is. We need to be on the same page. That's the big hurdle. Let's just go back to yesterday. What, when, when did you see him last yesterday? I haven't. Craig's mother says she recently kicked her son out of the house for skipping school. Um, he is, I told him, you know, if you stay with me, you have to go to school. You need to get your stuff, you need to go. And not to mention the fact that he smokes. And it's just certain things I'm not gonna condone. Marijuana? Yes. Okay. Just a few days after he was kicked out, she got an urgent call from her son on Halloween night. I asked him what's going on. He said he's okay, that he was in the apartments, in the hallway. Mm -hmm. uh, some guys came in and all he heard was bullets ringing out. Okay. Uh, he said that he was running for, he was scared. He was running for his life. Did he mention to you that someone had been shot and killed? Yes. Did it appear that something was eating at him? I don't remember. I think, to be honest with you, I was just happy that my son was alive. OK. And then you decided today to put him on a bus? Yes. Okay. After the Halloween night incident, Craig's mother enrolled him in a military school and just today put him on a bus headed for Georgia. Does your son, does he have a good heart? He's a good kid. Yeah. Yes, he OK. Was. Menina breaks the news that Craig could be more than simply a witness to the murder. To be perfectly honest, at this point in time, he is a suspect. Let me, let me ask you this. Hearing this information and seeing how he's behaved, could it fit? I just don't see him. I, I, honestly, God, I just don't see my son mm -hmm. doing this. Once again, Menina needs help from a loved one to move the case along. She needs Craig's mother to get him back to Indianapolis. This is my suggestion to you. I would grab him up and not tell him anything mm -hmm. about what I told you. Mm -hmm. I would just say, you know what? The detective needs to talk to you, and we'll get you back on the bus. Had I known this, mm -hmm. I guarantee you wouldn't be on this bus. Mm -hmm. I can't this. I mean, I feel bad for her. You know, you hate to tell a mother like that who is a good person and, you know. But I guarantee he's probably coming back tomorrow on the next, on the next uh, bus. But the next day, Craig is nowhere to be found. Talk to mom, she's not bringing him in. So I'm uh, irritated about that. All that looks bad. Hello? Three days later, Menina gets a call. It's Craig's mother. That's okay. Menina needs to convince her to bring Craig in. I have to have him come in and talk to me about that. That's what I'm saying. And by him not doing that, do you know how bad that looks? If Menina can't get Craig to talk, she'll have no way to determine what happened the night of the homicide. The thing about it is this. We know he's involved, OK? If he did not pull the trigger, then by God, he knows exactly who did, OK? And it blows my mind that you're not grabbing his ass up as his mother and say, get your ass in there, talk to the detective, tell the truth, and get in front of this. Bring him in with legal representation. Bring your son in with legal representation. Okay. All righty. All right, bye. Hey, mom called. She's really battling doing the right thing because she knows the right thing's going to f up her son. The next day, Craig, his mother, and their attorney arrive 
so Menina can take a statement. I want to know who the other shooter was. Somebody in the courtyard firing away. So that's got to be shorty. Okay. Menina needs to know who fired the shot that killed Jonathan Brewster. And if it was Craig, was he acting in self-defense? Young man, I just need the truth, okay? So that day, uh, where did you go? On the night of the murder, Craig says he went to see a friend in the building. At around 8 p.m., they smoked marijuana in the hallway. Do you, do you deal weed too? And it, I don't care if you do or not. Yeah. So you were over there dealing weed that night. Okay. And then what happens? Craig says his friend went into his apartment, leaving him alone in the hall. Then three men entered the building. They surround me. When they come in, you grab me by the collar of my black hood, mm -hmm. slam me on the mailbox. You pull out the pistol, you say, give me all your money. Mm -hmm. So I don't got no money. I don't got nothing. That's when my wife's getting the guy went in my pocket. He told me, wait till he went all the way in my pocket to grab all my money. He said, all right, we can go. Okay. But before the robbers got out the door, Craig's friend came back into the hallway okay. with a pistol. As soon as they see us meet up, they can begin to shoot. Okay. Boom. Once they start That's when Craig's friend handed him the gun. So they still shoot and I return. Right. Okay. And as you're shooting, is somebody shooting at you? Yes. Okay, so you're shooting in the direction of the shots are coming at you? Yes. Okay. Let me ask you this. Were you inside or were you outside when you fired the gun? Outside. Okay, are you shooting as you're running out? Or are you no, waiting until not. you're completely outside? I was completely out. You were completely outside, okay. Craig admits that he chased the robbers outside. How many times did you fire the gun? Four. Four times? When did you realize that you hit the victim? In this whole scenario, when do you realize it? Give me a second. It's not been established that he's hit the, the victim. Even though he's confessed to pulling the trigger, Craig claims he doesn't know if he fired the lethal shot. When did you learn that someone had died? I did see him. I seen put the old. Okay. I just want to make sure that you have told me everything, because this is what will happen. I will present everything to the prosecutor. There are definitely some inconsistencies. Okay. You guys are free to go. In a nutshell, he was on the steps. Uh, he gets. He says he gets robbed. Altercation, physical fight, escalates to shots being fired. Interestingly enough, though, he says he runs out last, chasing these guys out the door. And then when he gets outside, he shoots four more times. But the problem lays in the fact that um, I think there were other opportunities for him to get away other than just to chase them out and then fire shots. He could have run out the other door. At the end of the day, we may never know who actually fired the fatal shot. Common sense tells you that uh, it was probably um, Craig, uh, because if you put it in Shorty's hand, then he shot his friend. Flip side of that, I've seen it uh, more times than once uh, in friendly fire that you accidentally shoot your friend. Prosecutor's office has everything, they're looking at everything, and uh, you know they'll make the ultimate decision on what the charges are gonna be.